Hey, it certainly is good to be with you again, even if we have to do it by means of video and can't see each other face to face. It's going to be even more fun when we have our first Zoom visit and can kind of see each other and talk and visit with each other. You know, I never thought I'd see a spring break turn into a spring vacation. <laughs> But many strange things have happened as we try to cope with the difficulties that this amazing pandemic has brought. I fear that there's going to be some difficult days ahead, but I'm confident that God will eventually help us to get through them. You know, there was a similar pandemic back in 1918 called the Spanish Flu. Um, but God pulled us through that one as well. And kind of interesting that the Spanish Flu kind of uh, caused more deaths for those who were younger rather than those who were older but let's let's bow for a moment and pray that god will will help us in this situation god so many are living in a hard situation as a result of this pandemic we need your help more than anything else to cause this to subside and so we pray that you will act quickly and intervene in the name of jesus this is our prayer amen Okay, now it's time to get back into learning some more in this class. You'll notice on the Google Classrooms that I put your assignments. Uh, we'll hold off on O'Connor and vocabulary for a while. Did I hear a few of you clapping? <laughs> so just follow the instructions in Google Classrooms and do the assignments. Now these assignments will not be graded this week. This is kind of a participation grade. We're just trying to play like this is again sort of, you know, the first day of school and we're trying to get the feel of things and how all this is going to work out as we uh, send in homework over the net and so forth. So go ahead and do the work. Don't, don't, don't shun getting the work done, but uh, uh, we're not going to be taking a grade on it per se, just to let you know. Uh, do any of you recall who was the last author that we studied? Well, if you said Mary Anton, then you are correct. Let's review her life's history for just a moment. She was born in 1881, and this is the house in which she was born. And these uh, next are some of the neighbors that she lived with in Russia. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, those folks are pretty uh, heavily clothed. Uh, it looks like they've got several layers on, so it must have been a pretty cold region that she lived in. She came to the U.S. when she was five years old, and she attended schools in Boston and later graduated from Columbia University. She began writing about education and immigration, and her book called The Promised Land was published in 1912. The promise of a free education was the reading that was assigned in the textbook. Uh, if you have your textbook, uh, you can re look at it again. But if you don't have your textbook, it's also posted online. I believe it's chapter 9 of that particular reading. And it's on page 691 if you have your textbook. In our last class, we talked about uh, the immigrant experience and how almost all go through what's been called culture shock. That's that frustration and sometimes depression that, that comes that a person can experience in a new culture because he or she really hasn't learned yet all the customs and the ways of doing things. And so they're kind of at a loss as to what to say. They're kind of at a loss as to what to do and, and to know the cues that, that are necessary. We also saw some research showing us some diverse areas in cultures like do people make their decisions individually or do they do that collectively do people adjust quickly or slowly to changes do people see authorities as a good thing or as a bad thing see these are some uh, differences that we saw that were discovered among uh, various cultures and cultures also have various outlooks on other areas as well for example time uh, what's late in a culture uh, status, uh, thinking, the ways of thinking, the ways of communicating. Uh, we like people to be direct and to the point, whereas in many Oriental societies, they like to kind of go around the subject and kind of make a spiral and then kind of zoom in on the main point. Uh, there's differences in relationships, differences in forms of worship. 
So we found out that with time, uh, a person could usually uh, begin to adapt to a new cultural situation, and if they remain long enough in the culture, they could even become bicultural. They, they sort of have the ability to live in two worlds, even though, as we're going to find out a little later, that can sometimes be a little difficult. Anton really praised America for its educational system, which offers a free education to all. She mentioned how her father never really uh, had this opportunity, and he discovered after coming to the U.S. that he was very deficient in many areas. So he set himself to the task of learning all that he could through reading, through hearing lectures, uh, through other means. And he especially wanted his children to have an education. But their poverty only allowed Mary to attend school. Uh, her sister, however, had to work in a factory uh, in, in, involved with child labor. Uh, this was a place where garments were made. So she would sit at the sewing machine every day while Mary was going to school. Uh, Mary was so excited on that first day of school, but her father may have been even more excited. Uh, here was her conclusion to that chapter, uh, talking about how excited her father was as well, that her, she, and, she, and, she was getting this chance to have a good education. She says once again, So it was with a heart full of longing and hope that my father led us to school on the first day. He took long strides in his eagerness, the rest of us running and hopping to keep up. At last, the four of us stood around the teacher's desk, and my father, in his impossible English, gave us over in her charge, with some broken word of his hopes for us that his swelling heart could no longer contain. So uh, we have a worksheet to help you review here. Uh, do that and then email it to me. There are some questions in your textbook that I'd like for you to answer by writing a paragraph on each of these in Google Docs and then share those with me. Uh, these questions are posted in the Google Classroom as well, but you can start thinking about them right now. The first question is, what role does the family play in the immigrant experience? What role does the family play in the immigrant experience? And write a paragraph to explain how Anton's family is important to her vision of America. And then the next question is, what is your opinion of Anton's belief in education? Is this element of the American dream still alive today? What is your opinion of Anton's belief in education, and is this element of the American dream still alive today? So those are the questions that I'd like for you to address in a paragraph that you put on Google Docs and then email that to me. The next author in your textbook is another immigrant named Young Wing. Here's some biographical information taken from a PowerPoint that I've made. It gives kind of a breakdown of his life year by year. Uh, well, not year by year, but the, the important years and what, what was happening. He was born in 1828 in China, and in 1835, his father sent him to a missionary school four miles away, especially to learn English. In 1841, he enrolled in the Morrison School, which was headed by S.R. Brown. In 1847, Brown returns to the U.S., and Wing is enrolled in the Monson's Academy in Massachusetts. In 1850, uh, Wing graduates from Monson's and then is accepted at Yale. And in 1852, Wing becomes a U.S. citizen. In 1854, Wing graduates from Yale, and he is the first Chinese student to do so uh, from an American college. In 1855, Wing returns to China, but he could not get a job in the Chinese civil service. In 1863, he begins to serve the Viceroy uh, Tsing Kuing Fan. Pardon me for the mispronunciation. If some of you Asian students want to correct me on that when we have our uh, conference, you can do so. 
1868, the Burling Game Treaty allowed an exchange of educational opportunities in both countries. And in 1871, Wing writes a plan for educating 120 students in America in four years. And then they would go back to China after they had received their education over here. In 1872, the first group was sent over to the facility, which was located in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, is anybody sleeping? Wake up, wake up, come on, get back with it now. Okay, all right, good deal. 1875. The last group of the 120 was sent over, and the average age of these boys was 12 years old. Wing marries Mary Kellogg in 7, 1876 and receives an honorary doctorate from Yale. In 1881, the first group was refused entrance into Annapolis and West Point. In other words, the boys were educated there in uh, Hartford, but as part of their education, they were then to go to West Point or Annapolis for further military training. But these uh, people at these academies were very leery about having foreigners come to train on American soil. And so they refused to accept these boys. And as a result of that, then the Chinese Educational Commission, which was the group that uh, Wing had been working closely with in China, decides they're just going to close the school and call all the students back to China again. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was in force, which prohibited students from entering the U.S. So, you know, the Burlingame Treaty earlier allowed them to come. There was kind of this exchange situation. But in 1882, now the two countries were sort of at odds with each other, and so now they're excluded. 1886, Wing's wife dies, and Wing raises and helps to educate his two sons. And in 1895, Wing returns to China and pushed for Chinese reforms. Then in 1898, the political party which Wing backed was overthrown, and Wing had to escape the country and flee to Hong Kong. In 1902, Wing returned to the U.S. He sees his youngest son graduate from Yale. And he remains illegally. In 1908, Wing returns to China to promote a joint military venture, which eventually fails. In 1909, Wing returns to Hartford and he writes his autobiography, My Life in China and America. And in 1912, Wing dies and is buried in a cemetery near Hartford. Now, that's a rather lengthy biography, but you sort of see the struggles of an individual who lived in two worlds. And you can see that it wasn't an easy thing to do, especially when the country's governments were sort of at odds with each other. Now, I'd like to read uh, those first couple of pages in our textbook to show you an important decision that Wing made when he was very young. So, if you have your textbook, or if you want to follow along online, uh, turn over to page 687, or 697, excuse me, 697, 697. This is chapter 5 called My College Days. Before entering Yale, I had not solved the problem of how I was to be carried through the collegiate course without financial backing of a definite and well-assured character. It was an easy matter to talk about getting an education by working for it, and then there is a kind of romance in it that cap captivates the imagination. But it is altogether a different thing to face it in a business and practical way. So it proved to me, after I had put my foot into it, I had no one except Brown, who had already done so much for me in bringing me to this country, and Hammond, who fitted me for college. To them I appeal for advice and counsel. I was advised to avail myself of the contingent fund provided for indigent students. I was in the hands of the trustees of the academy, and so well guarded, oh, it was in the hands of the trustees of the academy, and so well guarded that it could not be appropriated without the recipient signing a written pledge that he would study for the ministry and afterwards become a missionary. 
Such being the case, I made up my mind that it would be utterly useless for me to apply for the fund. However, a day was appointed for me to meet the trustees in the parsonage to talk over the subject. They said they would be too glad to have me avail myself of the fund, provided I was willing to sign the pledge that after graduation I should go back to China as a missionary. I gave the trustees to understand that I would never circumscribe, I would never give such a pledge for the following reasons. First, it would handicap and circumscribe my usefulness. I wanted the utmost freedom of action to avail myself of every opportunity to do the greatest good in China. If necessary, I might be obliged to create new conditions. If I found old ones were not favorable to any plan I might have for promoting her highest welfare. In the second place, the calling of a missionary is not the only sphere in life where one can do the most good in China or elsewhere. In such a vast empire, there can be hardly any limit put upon one's ambition to do good if one is possessed of the Christ spirit and on the other hand, if one has not such a spirit, no pledge in the world could melt the ice-bound soul. In the third place, a pledge of that character would prevent me from taking advantage of any circumstance or event that might arise in the life of a nation like China to do her a greater service. For these reasons, I said, I must decline to give the pledge and at the same time decline to accept your kind offer to help me. I thank you, gentlemen, very much for your good wishes. Both Brown and Hammond afterward agreed that I took the right view on the subject and sustained uh, me in my position. To be sure, I was poor, but I would not allow my poverty to gain the upper hand and compel me to barter away my inward convictions of duty for a temporary mess of pottage. That temporary mess of pottage, anyone know what that is? Yeah, that's right. An allusion, you know, to Jacob and Esau. How Jacob uh, got the birthright from Esau by offering him a bowl of porridge or a bowl of pottage. And so uh, we see here that he says he was not going to uh, barter away his liberty uh, and his uh, poverty for... Um, trying to accept this pledge that they tried to force upon him in order to have the funds. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting that you noticed he was thinking very long range because he realized that um, he could return to China and that after returning there, something could come up where he could not do the mission work that they had sort of wanted him to do. But maybe there was something else that he could do that could be even more productive and useful for the country. So he felt that it was better to decline and give himself that freedom rather than to be bound and restricted just to doing strictly mission work. And, and that's something you can think about, too. If you ever have the opportunity to, to work in a foreign country, um, you, can be a, you can be someone who, through your work, can evangelize for Christ as well. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a missionary, per se, in order to have an impact and an influence on that particular culture. So I think that's very interesting. Also, now that we've seen kind of the introduction to the work, um, go ahead and continue to read and see what develops uh, during this time period as he is going to school and some of the struggles that he had uh, as a student as well. That's about it for this time, and I hope that the uh, Lesson didn't bore you to tears too badly. If you have any questions, be ready to ask those when we get together for our Zoom meeting. Until next time, may God bless you and protect you.